Welcome back to Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. I've done some inventory management and I figured we could talk to the uh, NPCs first and foremost. Um, and just uh, get a little bit of a catch up on the. Uh, that's not catch up, but catch up on the uh, storylines. So let's start with Camellia since we now know that she is Horgus' daughter. So, you are Horgus's daughter. Um, yeah, we've already heard that response. Okay, then let's see with the Diaran. The Defender's Heart is a splendid choice for the Crusade's outpost. The very sight of these walls brings back fond memories of drinks and revels. The drinks were really good, by the way. People say that you are deliberately trying Queen Galfrey's patience. Is that true? Does it even matter? All of Mandevian high society has declared war on me. They either despise me or they are trying to steer me back onto the right path, and I'm doing everything in my power to keep them on their toes. I relish the prospect of all this fun, this of all the fun this mess in Canabras will bring. Dairon grins from ear to ear. I shall either commission a song about the great Canabras fiasco from a great, from a certain talented bard, or confuse the jewelers with a rather tall order, a batch of silver dragon toys with detachable heads. Give me a week, and they will be in every shop in the capital. The heroic dragon who died for our future deserves respect, not your mockery. She's dead. She doesn't really care. And I shall enjoy three or four minutes of rather pleasant thoughts about the rage of those sanctimonious fools who pestered me the most. May I ask you a few personal questions? You can try. I have heard stories about the tragedy that befell your family. I hope you don't feel obliged to offer me your insincere condolences on this unfortunate occasion. My whole family, my entire noble line, they all died. And the demons are to blame. It's not like I actually loved any of my relatives except for my mother, but what's gone is gone. The family's crypts are full of corpses, all covered in dust and the shadows of the past. What do you cherish most in life? There are far too many things that I cherish to fit them all into a single conversation. Believe it or not, but I might be one of the most life-loving people you've ever known. Darren smiles. His eyes are gleaming with something different from his usual impudence and irony, and there's a dreamy air about him all of a sudden. I rarely meet anyone who embraces the joys of living as enthusiastically as myself. There are so many exciting and beautiful things in the world. It should be illegal to waste your time on anything you do not enjoy. And I am not afraid to repeat that anyone that to anyone's face, should it be Descari and his demonic herd, or Iomade, the Lightbringer herself. What do you hate the most? The feeling of helplessness, the lack of control over my own life. Darren replies without thinking, and then he adds with obvious sarcasm. And onion rings, of course. I'd murder the person who came up with those abominations. You don't seem especially keen on helping people, but your knowledge of healing is truly impressive. What prompted your interest in that? Ah, if you really want to try out everything life has to offer, you also have to understand how to deal with the consequences. And I'm not talking about a simple hangover, mind you. Do you have any good stories about your past exploits? I've got plenty, but I have to warn you that even the most outrageous debauchery sounds far less thrilling when you were not the one doing the debauching. Still, since you asked, I suppose the worst mess I've ever got myself into was when I staged my own kidnapping. I was once in correspondence with one of the Riverland's nobles, the young Lord Lebida, and he told me about his days as a hostage to a group of bandits. This made me wonder what it would be like, and I thought that it might be fun to set up a little experiment. I engineered my own kidnapping by a certain gang through a chain of intermediaries and hired actors. Those fellows took the job very seriously. They caught me by surprise, killed my two bodyguards and even tied me up. Of course, the whole thing seems preposterous now, but it seemed like an ingenious idea at the time. 
The employers had told the kidnappers that they were to keep me safe and sound, and another group of mercenaries in disguise was watching the spectacle from afar, did to interfere in case anything went wrong. It turned out to be a terrible idea, nonetheless. It wasn't the least bit fun or exciting. Sure, those bandits had been unable to torture or hurt me physically in any way, but they had plenty of other non-invasive methods of humiliation in their arsenal. Taking almost all of your clothes off and splashing ice-cold water all over you, for example. Ugh, I can't even remember if I said anything truly offensive to provoke them. Even though I initially planned to let them go after the ransom, their overly emotional reactions made me change my mind. I told my mercenaries to hang them all on the spot. I suppose the whole ordeal taught me a valuable lesson, which is that I am not built for hardships and trials. Wait, you just told me that a couple of your bodyguards died during the staged kidnapping. Does that mean two innocent people lost their lives so that you could have a bit of fun? Darren pales a little, but not out of shame. Oh, spare me. It irks me beyond more measure when I hear about the suffering of innocents. He sighs, looks away, and continues in a flat, polite tone. Yes, the bodyguards died. Guarding nobles is a dangerous job. They were well aware of the risk. I don't really see a problem with that. Besides, they proved their incompetence. They would have stood no chance against real kidnappers. Your cruel jokes bring people nothing but misery. And? So, that was a stupid story, and now I'll tell you a truly brilliant one. Prelot Hulrun had always strictly prohibited any public celebration in Canabras, and he always picked on me for my lack of respect for the fallen and whatnot. What not. His grumbling annoyed me so much that one day I drove four barges into the city harbour and set up a celebration on their decks. The ships on the river didn't fall under the prelate's jurisdiction, you see, so all he could do was snarl at me from the embankment. I, for one, did not forget the old boy. The main attraction of the festivities involved an inquisitor of Iomede dancing and roasting beautiful witches on illusory bonfires, taking off his clothes with every new victim. The spectacle was so heated, in every sense of the word, that the prelate almost had a stroke. Darren gives you a mischievous smile. Somehow I actually find that a bit amusing. I still consider that one of my finest ideas of all time. Should the Crusaders ever succeed in their efforts against the world wound, I will do my utmost to get permission to hold a grand public celebration. Rivers of wine free of charge, an obligatory parade and a carnival in the evening. A contest for the most provocative succubus costume with a hefty prize in gold. Another contest where the participants will have to fish a sausage out of a wine jar blindfolded with their hands tied behind their backs. The wine will symbolize the blood of all the dead heroes of the war, and the sausage, well, they'll find a heroic meaning for that as well. Over the years, the commemoration of the greatest victory of light over darkness will turn into an ordinary holiday, a fine excuse to get sloshed and rut like animals in the streets. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do you enjoy being mean to everyone? Yes. And here I thought you were hurling insults at people purely by accident. <laughs> this is hilarious. Darren laughs. This time his smile is surprisingly soft. I like your way with words. What did you expect me to say if I wanted to make a good impression? Something along the lines of, I'm not mean, I'm just being honest with myself and everyone else. That's what people use an, as an excuse when they want to keep up their saccharine facade, facade while still saying whatever nasty little thoughts spring to mind. He's got a point there. That is not what I do. I have no hidden agenda. I'm just as much of an insufferable prick as I seem to be. Some people are simply begging for a good dose of mockery, so who am I to deny them? I don't give a damn if anyone holds a grudge against me, which is why I don't even try to avoid it. Okay, this 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 guy is actually pretty amusing. I I hope this conversation was at least the slightest bit amusing. Yes, actually, it was quite amusing. I'd like to talk about life in Mendeth and the Crusade. Ask. I am all ears. What is your opinion on Mendeth today in general? It doesn't exist, Darren scowls. 
It is a frontier country that has attracted every utopian, adventurer and fanatic from all over the world for more than a century. It is a place where the strangers outnumber the locals, especially in the cemeteries. The population of Mendev for the most part consists of humans and other races not exactly known for their longevity, so the current generation of Mendevians were born in the shadow of the world wound and raised by the Crusades. I might be the last person to complain about the decline of traditions and lack of character in our country, but I also happen to come from one of Mendev's most ancient lineages. It is, its history is bred deep in my bones. My tutors told me stories about my heritage, the galleries, the libraries, and even the interiors of the old manors I grew up in were filled to the brim with memories of events long past. There are many heroes of old Mendev among my glorious ancestors, or at the very least patrons and contemporaries of such hero heroes. Does anyone actually remember them no now? I don't think so. These days, Mendev has its own heroes, in shining armor and with holy fire in their eyes. I myself remember how several streets that once celebrated my ancestors were renamed in honor of some crusaders who had died in a heroic fashion. None of the citizens remember the old crossing festival that was eventually replaced by Armas. These holidays even share the same date. Pretty much the only authentic thing about Mendev now is its endless war with the demons. And is there a point in bemoaning this state of affairs? What is gone is gone, but at least we are no longer some tiny godforsaken northern kingdom, and that's something, isn't it? You don't really like crusaders, do you? Quite the opposite. When I think about how many devoted heroes are willing to protect this world against the demonic threat, I feel so inspired. Inspired to continue indulging my vices while they fight to keep me safe. Imagine being someone like me, someone who has everything they can possibly desire. Youth, beauty, wealth, an honest wish to live and enjoy living, but vanishingly few ways to put it all to any use. The fact that the word fun itself is not yet outlawed in Mendev must be due to some bureaucratic oversight. You can celebrate your victories solemnly, you can wet your whistle after, challenge, after challenging battle, but what about real fun? Joys, pleasures? I can't remember a single evening at court without someone chastening me for my banquets, my lovers and mistresses, my luxuriant clothes, my everything. It would have been a lot easier to tolerate all those hypocrites if they took a break once in a while. Instead, there was a constant fuss about how I wasn't doing anything for the greater good and how I only brought shame to my royal cousin. What do you think about our enemies? Do you mean the demons themselves or their followers? The former deserve to be cleansed with heavenly fire for their unholy origin alone, and the latter for their idiocy. I don't understand why a sane person would submit themselves to Descari or Cabri Cabriri. Alright, Lady Nocticula almost seems like a bearable enough mistress, yet there are so many other cultists. They've tried to recruit me twice already. I'm not I, I'm not even that old. First, a very pretty tiefling girl tried to seduce me, and then they came with promises of Lord Baphomet's endless boons. I still wonder what exactly the old hornhead could offer me that I don't already have. You know what I've been thinking? Every shopkeeper knows this trick. An enticing offer along the lines of one in every hundred buns from my bakery contains a silver coin. And, of course, a hired actress to make a memorable show of finding said coin in her sweet roll. And there you have it. Hundreds of gullible fools storm the shop hoping to win a prize for themselves. I think the infamous Arlu Vorlish was such an actress for the Lords of the Abyss. A pretty Sarkorian witch who became the uncrowned queen of the world wound, waited upon hand and foot by demon lords. Only, instead of visiting a bakery, the gullible fools rush to join the cultists. We have an army of unbelievably powerful supernatural invaders from another dimension, hell-bent on destruction and domination, and what do those fools do? They serve them willingly as pawns and lackeys, hoping against hope that someday their masters will notice them. You won't believe how delighted I am to be so vain and self-absorbed. These sins protect me against demonic temptation better than any virtue. Geesh, it almost makes sense. 
I can't think of anything else at the moment. Wonderful. What made you join my party, after all? You mean instead of carousing far away from Canabras with a small army of mercenaries to protect me? I will get to that. You see, when you appeared at my door out of nowhere, awash with bravery and heroism and started tossing demons around like ragdolls, I thought that your company might be more exciting than my usual crowd of psychophantic hangers-on. You seemed um, competent and mysterious at the same time, so I decided that a little demon hunting wouldn't hurt, especially with such an intriguing entourage. That party had been growing staler with every passing second anyway. Needless to say, I'm not here for long. I shall return to the capital, or even one of my country estates, as soon as we reclaim the city. Crusades, bellowing commanders, a row upon row of identical tents. This is not the life for me. But I will certainly remember you and our adventures together. For a week, or perhaps even longer than that. Why, thank you. I should go. Goodbye. Ember. Uh, we will talk to her. Um, in here, I think we're done talking to Waldriff as well. Somebody in my comments mentioned something to me, though. Yenaug. Um, Autumn Haze. Yeah, so what was mentioned to me in the comments is that if you open the inventory and you click Finian, you can start the dialogue with his weapon. Hail to the adventurers! You know, I've never regretted following you. Everyone seems to revolve around you, like beavers in a middle wheel. I'll have a lot to write in my report to the Pathfinder Society. Although, thinking about it, it's been a while since I last sent them any reports. I want to talk about you. Sure, go ahead. Although I haven't really done anything no noteworthy yet. Do you realize that you are a weapon? What kind of a question is that? I mean, sure, the clerics keep going on about every crusader being a weapon of Iomidae, but I don't speak of myself in fancy words like that. I'm just a lad with two arms, two legs, and more freckles than I'd like. I choose where to go and whom to fight for. I don't want to be someone's a weapon, you hear? Aradon is dead. Now everybody decides their own fate. Interesting. So, apparently he's not aware. How did you become a Pathfinder? I've always wanted to be one. Ever since I was a kid. I remember I'd go out to the edge of the village at sunset and then just keep walking until I got tired or someone dragged me back by my ear. It was like something was drawing me away from home. My clan wasn't the nomadic kind. Before the wound opened, the idea of travelling anywhere would never have crossed the minds of many in the clan. They were content with their community or their patch of land. But I always... I had always wanted to see what lay beyond that bend in the road, over that familiar hill beyond the horizon. My father, he wanted to teach me to be a shaman like him, but as soon as I came of age, I was off looking for the Pathfinder Society. And I found it, in Iz, after three weeks of travel on foot. I passed the trials and they accepted me. My father hasn't spoken to me since, but that's alright. Once he hears of my great deeds, he'll come around. Someday. All I wanted was to rush off to some faraway land and find a treasure trove no one else had discovered yet, but I knew I had a duty to Sarkoris. Then the wound opened, the demons, the havoc. In the end, I never went anywhere. But as soon as things calm down, I'm setting off to explore Aslantl. Or Aslant. I've already decided. Great ancient ruins, that's my kind of life. Being surrounded by the wreckage here is depressing, as I'm sure you know. Do you remember anything from before you ended up in Canabras? There is uncertainty in Finian's voice. I mean, a lot of things happened. I remember how happy everyone was when the Wardstone was placed in Canabras. That was some celebration. Is that old? Finian is silent for a few moments. And I remember when the cultists took me, cut down my whole party and dragged me to their ringleader. Don't know his name, everyone just called him the bladesmith. But after that my memory is all fuzzy, 
For some reason, he didn't sacrifice me or anything, just knocked me around. Said he'd been looking for a phantom blade for a long time. I don't remember why. Hmm. How I escaped what I did? Can't remember that either. Some crusader picked me up in the wound, brought to Canabras. And that's where I stayed, licking my wounds. Maybe there was a mix-up and now they think I'm dead. Why else would none of them contact me this whole time? The wardstone, you say? What you're describing happened decades ago. <laughs> That's rich. Next you're going to tell me I've been sleeping for decades. Last year that was. Well, maybe the year before last. I couldn't have been wandering the wound that long. I would have been either dead or an old geezer by now. Ah, quit messing with me. Finian, you need to understand you are not human anymore. Finian's voice sounds concerned. Hey, are you feeling alright? Maybe you need to have a lie down. I am standing right in front of you. Poke me if you like, as human as they come. Or do you think my travels have worn me down so much I've become an animal? Not happening. My folks taught me to stay human always, no matter the circumstances, to remember who I am and never to shame my ancestors. Are you able are you still able to commune with the spirits? Maybe I can, only they don't want to answer me. I am still a spiritualist, a phantom blade. My power is within me, but I have this feeling like I'm separated from the spirit world by some kind of transparent wall. I keep knocking, but no one can hear me. I think... <laughs> guess all the bladesmith's torture did a number on me. He broke something inside. I want to talk about something else. Go for it. Tell me about the Pathfinder Society. Oh, well, sometimes folks curse our names, calling us opportunists who just want to line our pockets. But that's only part of it. We are travelers, explorers, solvers of mysteries, and fighters of evil. I mean, good coin hasn't hurt anybody yet. But for folks like me, it's not what matters most. We are curious to see the world, play a part in everything, stick our nose everywhere. Getting into our circle isn't easy. First, you must prove that you can endure any place you're sent to, that you won't shy away or flee. That's why you'll never catch a long line of applicants outside any society lodge. Every lodge has a venture captain, and if they approve your application, you're in. And there are many lodges all over the world, but the main one, the Grand Lodge, is located far away in Absalom. I've never been there myself, but I've heard a lot of stories about it, and about the decemvirate that governs all Pathfinder affairs from there. Can I quick save here? I'm curious about this. That is all for now. I should get going. If you feel like chatting, I'm always here. Yeah, kind of in my pocket. Just want to see what that does saying that specific thing to him. What is this? You talk too much. It's annoying. You're a weapon, nothing more. Whoa, what's all this about? Watch what you're saying, or I might take it personally. Will you shut up already? I don't need you. I'll sell you to the first merchant I meet. Finian's fall silent forever by the looks of it. Okay. Yep. Lost item. Finian, the talking weapon. That was interesting. Um, I really wonder what Finian is going to end up being. He might become an intelligent weapon, or... I don't know. Yeah, so I've also sold a couple of things, and I should put some things back into the stash. But first, let's see if there's anyone else we can talk to here. I'm uh, gone. Does Kiado want to say something? Or... Oh! Vizali Rathimus. A stout old man with a fuzzy grey beard mumbles a prayer. He looks as tired as everyone else in the tavern, but determination is stamped upon his haggard face. What can I do for you? Whenever I sleep outside the walls of the Defender's heart, I'm plagued by terrible dreams. Can you help me? Hmm. The priest studies your face carefully. You look tired, but otherwise entirely healthy. If we were anywhere else, I would simply tell you to get some rest, but we are on the border of the World Wound, and I'm all too aware of what's happening to you. As you know, the Wound is a rift between Golarion and the Abyss, and all the evil that feeds the Abyss does the opposite in our world. 
it feeds on Golarion. So it is that even when we cannot see demons near us, our ultimate foe, the Abyss, is always surrounding us. Many soldiers fighting in the World Wound experience similar things. They suffer terrible nightmares, get no peace, and sometimes even lose their minds. But we are trained to help you with this affliction. By the will of Abadar, I have consecrated an altar here. The God's Grace permeates the space around it, soothing one's soul and quieting thoughts during rest. So, if you find your nerves are fraying, seek out a holy place like this, approach it, and all the corruption will be cleansed from you. Who are you? Vizali Rathimus, rector of the local temple of Abadar. Uh, the temple is gone though, and if we snooze here for much longer, the city will be lost as well. Who is that boy with you? This one? Kiado the shepherd, my apprentice. He is a smart boy and his faith is strong. He serves Erastil though, but there is still something he can learn from an old servant of Abadar. He'll be a great cleric when he gets a little older. What kind of help can I expect from you? First, I sell scrolls. I have a lot of them, something for every emergency. Second, while you are here in the tavern, I can read one for you, guaranteed no surprises. But you'd better not go into the city without a cleric. I won't be going there myself. I am too old and my powers are needed here. Tell me again about the Abyss's corruption. Same thing. Show me the scrolls you're selling. Yeah. You'd better have a lot of money if you want to play with people dying. Not that I don't have enough money after I sold stuff, but still. Um, a couple of those and a couple of those I think would be a good idea to just have hanging around. That's nice. I'll buy those. These might be useful, but... Take a couple of those. All lightning, eh? Protection from fire. <clears throat> okay, so this is total. 12 points per caster level. So that would be 12, 70, 7, 80... That's pretty nice. Whereas this one is resist energy 10. Yeah. Guardian of life. Hmm. Icy protector. Alchemist's kit. That might be useful actually. Also he has scroll scribers kits. And slimy skin. Mm. Uh, other than that, I don't see anything particularly useful here. Glitter dust, that might be useful. See invisibility as well. I mean, I, having all these monies doesn't really help me. Uh, it's better to have stuff. Oh, and the door in the uh, mansion of Gurm, uh, it's been fixed, so this one wouldn't work. I think I could take a couple of these as well. Fire snake. A 50 foot long line of flames, well then. He does sell a lot of scrolls, that's for sure. Did I... Oh, I thought I saw something about... Scroll of genie kind. Yeah, he has a whole lot of scrolls, that is for sure. But... Some of these are just too expensive for me to want to uh, spend money on them. Deal. 
10,000 spent. Um, I bought some more potions as well. Yeah, so now I have a couple of those, but I also bought that one. Uh, and I think I want to equip that. These are luck bonus. We put that on Neneo. I refuse to cooperate. Or maybe not. For some reason, she doesn't want to wear them. He doesn't want to wear them. Waldrip doesn't want to wear them. Lan doesn't want to wear them. Right, so only Caledon wants to wear these. Why? What? Huh? Oh. They are specific to Caledon. Okay. Well done. Follow my steps. Uh, Lan. Nothing new. Hello. Not sure. Oh, retrain. Yeah, if I want to respec ca character completely. Anivia. Look who it is. Hi. Tell me about yourself. The girl shrugs with a lazy smile. I'd be happy to, but there's kind of nothing to tell. What's so interesting about me? Where are you from? Nowhere. I was blown in by the wind and found in a cabbage patch. The girl stopped short. <laughs> Sorry, that's an old habit of mine. I don't like blabbing about my past, but you saved my skin, so I guess I kinda owe it to you to not clown around, right? I'm from Nidal, and I wouldn't wish my homeland on my worst enemy. You've heard of the place, I'm sure. Ruled by monsters that aren't alive nor dead, and the official religion is the cult of Zon Kuthon. I grew up in a slum, like a weed between the cobblestones. I didn't have a dad, but I had lots of aunts and uncles. My mum's cronies. No, got no prize for guessing the kind of business she was involved in. They gave me a set of lockpicks as soon as I could hold a spoon, and while other kids were picking their noses, I was picking pockets. When I was twelve, the monks of the Silent Shroud came for us. Creepy guys with their mouths sewn shut. They are the guards in Nisrock. Mum gave me to her friends, and we hid in a secret temple of Desna. I never saw my mum again. I lay, I lay low in the temple for the next few years, keeping my head down. I washed floors, fetched floors, fetched water, listened to sermons. Funny thing, after a while I started liking Desna's teachings. But as soon as I was old enough, I was out of there. I left Nidal and got as far away as I could. Quite a ragtag group you've got here, from nobles to street thieves. You got that right. <laughs> Only the best for you. What do you do if the knights and nobles fail to save the world? Well, the low lives are our only hope. How did you meet Irabeth? I was bumming around Timon a while back, doing this and that. Desnan temples sometimes gave me odd jobs. You know, sometimes they needed people with skills like mine. On the surface, it was fine, I guess. After Nidal, the freedom of River Kingdoms should have seemed like heaven. My chance to sit back and enjoy life. But I wasn't happy. There just wasn't any joy in my new life. I was all alone. No one cared about me, and I didn't care about anybody either. I struggled to find a reason to drag myself out of bed every morning. Tying a stone around my neck and jumping into the nearest river started to look pretty appealing. One day, I was hired to follow some fellas who the local authorities suspected were Razmiran spies. I was stupid, I made a rookie mistake, and they caught me. It's like my body had already decided to do what my mind had been fighting, to finally put me out of my misery. Get someone else to kill me, since I didn't have the guts to do it myself. They grabbed me, and I thought they'd gut me on the spot, but instead they hogtied me and dragged me off. And just like an animal going to the slaughter, my only thought was, let's get this over with. They brought me to their stinking cave, 
threw me on their altar and I realized who it was. Cuthetus from Nidal, or Cuthites. They'd tracked me down after all those years, but I didn't care anymore. Wouldn't even have cared if they had eaten me or whatever. We all got to go sometime, right? So I was lying there, staring at those knives pointed at me, when fate rolled the dice and I hit the jackpot. Irabeth. There she was, storming into the cave. Picture it. I'm lying on an altar with all these knife-wielding maniacs around me and suddenly Irabeth storms in. I thought it was Iomede herself. Fierce in her shining armor with her gleaming sword raised. She made quick work of those scumbags, chopped them up just like that. I didn't even have time to blink. She untied me, and then... The girl's face lights up as she chuckles. She looked through the papers they had on the table, and she just started swearing like a sailor. So much for Iomade. <laughs> How did you and Irabeth end up in Kedabras? After almost becoming a human sacrifice, I knew I never wanted to leave Irabeth's side. Desna knows I fell for her instantly, and I fell hard. My misery had gone. And when Irabeth showed me what was in those papers, proof that the cultists had a nest in her home city, well, I offered to help without a second thought. Anivia smiles warmly. She must have figured I couldn't wait to get her my revenge on the cultists, but I didn't give a damn about them. It was her. I'd go anywhere with her, even on a crusade or into the jaws of a dragon. But I took to life in Canarbus like duck to water. I used to be an outcast wherever I went, but half of the crusaders are the same. After all, who would volunteer to tangle with demons on the edge of the abyss? You gotta either be a goody two-shoes with too much honor and free time, or a misfit with no life out in the normal world with normal people. People come here to run away from their debts, their paths, from their self from themselves, so I fit right in. What is it like living with Irabeth? It's like living. Without her, I wouldn't be. Seriously, if I were alone, I'd definitely be gone by now. Sure, sometimes we argue, can't deny that. Sometimes we bang our fists on the table and yell so loud that the walls shake. But that's all about order business. But at home? Well, I'll give you an example. I've kinda always wanted to move out of that broom closet we call a house and into somewhere cozier. It ain't like they take a vow of poverty at the Eagle Watch. But every month, somehow most of our spare money is spent on crusader business. Sure, I get mad about it, but... Anivia makes a helpless gesture. It's part of why I love her so much. You know, Erebeth has that thing that matters most for a person. A purpose in life. She's always got a reason for whatever she's doing. Her whole life is a crusade, and I? I just drifted around like a leaf in the wind until Desna brought us together. Now she's the meaning of my life, so it really makes no difference if we live in a mansion or under a bush. Thank you for your answers. Thanks for asking. Telling you all this kind of made me feel better. What are your responsibilities in the Eagle Watch? Anivia smiles evasively. Nothing official. I'm not even a knight, you know. I just hang around. Sure you want to know the details? Catching traitors and spies and cultists is no walk in the park. It's a delicate job. You can't always do it, all within the letter of the law. What if we surprise some suspicious blighter with an official search? Everyone will know about it long before long, starting with their cronies. But then again, sneaking into people's houses at night ain't exactly legal. Crusaders can't be doing stuff like that, can they? Well, I'm not exactly a knight. The girl trails off. I have to go. Right, you watch yourself now. And then finally, Irabeth herself. Her. So I think that's about everyone that we could talk to at the inn. I don't think that Staunton has anything new to say. Oh, I've seen how the other soldiers treat you. What about it? The dwarf's tone makes it clear that he has no interest in your answer. It's inhumane. It's been my life for many decades. Staunton shrugs indifferently. 
He's a curious fellow, that Staunton. Uh, I th think I want to do a rest. Why did I'm not sure why this isn't, isn't voiced over. I never understand why people. <laughs> yep. Doesn't make sense if I just read it out now. Nine hours, that is not too bad. Well, uh, the final thing that I want to do here is to uh, stash a couple of things in the chest here, because I don't feel like walking around with these uh, heavy items. Um, so I'll stash these in the chest, come together with the armor, and these two. As for the rest, we will bring those with us, and in the next episode we shall let's be going out. out into the city, as he said, let's head out. If you do have any questions or comments, then please do feel free to leave those in the comment section, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope to be seeing you all in the next one.